Hi, everyone. Welcome to the December 4th edition of the Timeform U.S. Forecast. I'm David Aragon. I'll be joined in just a moment by my co-host, Craig Mulkowski. This week on the podcast, we're going to be doing some handicapping at Aqueduct this weekend. It is their final grade one race of the season. That's the Cigar Mile, which will be contested on Saturday. And we've got those usual undercard stakes also taking place. Those pair of two-year-old graded stakes, the Remsen and the Demoiselle. We'll talk about all of them as well as the Gopher Wand, which they're also running on that card. So we'll talk about those four stakes races, then go through the entire late pick five sequence comprising races six through ten ending with that Cigar Mile, which is the last race on the card. And Craig, I know they moved some of these races back a week in a couple of years ago, hoping to get some Breeders' Cup horses running back in five weeks. I guess a couple horses are running back from the Breeders' Cup potentially, but hasn't really panned out that it's made it stronger races. And some of these stakes have come up a little bit thin. Yeah, and I think you're being generous there. Uh, definitely, we have only a five-horse Remsen. I don't think that Demoiselle is anything particular. I mean, it's okay, but nothing great. Uh, the Cigar Mile, I- I'm not sure I remember a weaker version of the Cigar Mile looking at the past performances coming in. But that said, I, I do think the latter two were at least good betting races. Uh, I don't think they're going to have any effect whatsoever on things like the Eclipse Awards or anything like that. But as a better, it's not bad. It- it's a decent Saturday, and I can see why they kind of split them up. We get two good Saturdays now instead of one. Now, before we get into these races, I should mention right off the bat that there's likely to be some weather in the New York area this weekend, really starting later today as we record this on Friday. Um, There are a number of turf races scheduled for this Friday card. We'll see if we get them all in at Aqueduct. Uh, But there's one turf race taking place on Saturday, and uh, it is part of that late pick five sequence. I would imagine it's not going to be on the turf, but we'll see if the forecasts do turn out to be right. But I think regardless of any of that, we're likely to see a sloppy track on Saturday. So just keep that in mind as we handicap these races. And let's begin um, early in the day with that fourth race. It's the grade two Remsen going a mile and an eighth on the main track, as Craig said. It's just a five horse field, though there are four legitimate contenders in this race. And it's not some race with a huge standout. I think you've got a pretty competitive bunch among those that were entered. Yeah, that's exactly what I wrote in my notes for this. It's a five horse field, but four of them are very evenly matched on the time form U.S. speed figures. Um, I'll be the first to say it's probably not the greatest betting race. But then again, you just... You never know what the the tote's going to offer you. I mean, we can always think we have a pretty good idea, but every now and then you get surprises. So I still like to go in with a plan. Uh, I do think the the most likely winner is the horse you tabbed as the morning line favorite of that contentious group known agenda. I trained by Todd Pletcher. He's already won at the mile and an eighth distance. Uh, he did it well. He, I, I really did like the way he finished off the race. So I, I don't have any knocks on him whatsoever. I, I think he is probably the horse to beat. Uh, there's a couple horses coming out of the Nashua stakes in here and picking time and 10 for 10. Um, I noted you had uh, 10 for 10 as a little lower uh, on the morning line than picking time, which makes sense being by Shug McGahee with Jose Ortiz compared to uh, picking time with Kelly Breen training and Jose Lizcano. But I have to be honest, of the two, I prefer picking time in here. Uh, He's out of stay thirsty. Uh, I don't see any reason he couldn't get the mile in the eighth. And I really didn't see any excuses for 10 for 10 there. So of those two, I would prefer picking time now maybe pick or 10 for 10 just loves the slop he did win two back easily and romp but the speed figures didn't really show he had any special edge over that slop so maybe he was just ran his normal race but that said after covering those three the horse if i had to make a top pick in here and the one i'll be looking to potentially bet would be the new york bred brooklyn strong who just uh I mean, he really jumped up last time when in that New York bred Sleepy Hollow stakes. I liked how he looked doing it. And his figure is right there with everybody else's. So I just, you know, like I said, he's not the most likely winner in this race. I think that's probably known agenda. But if his odds drift up a little higher than that seven to two morning line, I'd be tempted to take a shot with him because I just don't think he is that far behind the others based on our speed figures. Yeah, I mean, I think you laid out the case for all four horses, and you really can make a case for for four of these five runners. Um, I'll, I'll kind of go through them in the same order that you did. Uh, known agenda, 
I guess he is the horse to beat, having handled the distance last time, and I agree with you, even though he only won that race by a head. I mean, those top two finishers drew over 20 lengths clear of the rest of the field, and frankly, Great Astoner, who was second in that race, he's another Shug McGahey horse with a big pedigree to go along, and they could have run him in here and he'd be one of the contenders. That's how strong those two top two finishers were in that maiden race. My one issue with known agenda is um, Todd Pletcher just generally gets overbet in these situations. And I think the stats, if you look them up in formulator, really corroborate that because off uh, a maiden win in dirt route graded stakes over the past five years, Pletcher's just one for 32. It's 3% win rate with an ROI of 30 cents. Uh, that was shocking to me because Pletcher runs a lot of horses off maiden victories that he steps right up into graded stakes, especially on the Derby trail. And while he ha he's had some success doing it, you know, going back a number of years over the past five years, just a single winner out of a lot of starters and many of them have been short prices. So that's a little concerning to me. And it just speaks to the fact that this horse might be a little overbet. So I'm using him, but I, I wanted to look elsewhere. Um, of those two horses coming out of the Nashua, I differ a little bit with you, Craig. I, I thought Pick and Time got a pretty good trip. I know he was a little wide on the turn, but I thought that's probably where you wanted to be at that day at Aqueduct. Um, he was out in the clear the entire way, and there was some pace ahead of him. I know none of the pace figures in the Time Form USPPs are color-coded red, uh, but they were moving up front in the early portion of that race, and he just kind of took it over and finished off the race decently. He's a big horse, so maybe the two turns is not going to pose an issue for him. On the damn side of his pedigree, I'd be a little concerned about him getting added ground, even though he is a son of Stay Thirsty. And out of the Nashua, I strongly prefer the number five in here, 10 for 10. I thought his hand was forced by drawing the rail that day, as uh, Eric Honsell had to be more aggressive than I think he otherwise would have been with some other stretch out sprinters in there that showed speed. And there were three horses that were vying for the lead in the early portion of that race. And uh, 10 for 10 lost by two lengths, but the other two horses that were up there with him lost by 12 and I think 38 lengths. So that was a pace that took its toll on some other horses. And 10 for 10 just looked like he got a little tired to me in the late stages. Uh, I think he's going to be fine going the mile and an eighth. He showed no signs of stopping in that maiden victory two back. He's got a, a real stamina oriented pedigree, especially on the dam side. His dam is a three quarter sister to Destin, who was second in the Belmont Stakes, as well as Vexatious, who uh, won going marathon distances on the turf and won the personal Lenson going nine furlongs at Saratoga last year. So I just think 10 for 10 is one of these Shogun horses that's slowly coming along. And as you said, he obviously handles the slop. So to me, he makes a lot of sense in here. And I think drawing on the outside with speed is going to really be to his benefit this time. Though I've got no problem with the horse that you mentioned, Brooklyn Strong. He gets a real class test here because I think he is facing a tougher group of open company horses than he was against New York Breds. But nothing about his prior races says that he's going to get worse with added distance. I'll probably appreciate it. I just worry if he quite classes up with these, but I'll definitely use him if he's the fourth choice. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. I just think it's one. It's going to be a fascinating race to watch. Um, I, I agree with you about 10 for 10. I mean, I think he's going to run fine. I'm just looking for it from a value standpoint. Um, I'm sure he. I would bet anything he's going to be uh, bet more heavily than the others, other than known agenda. I did want to bring up what you said about Pletcher. That that was an interesting set and something I've noticed. Uh, that was something I bet if you ran that stat three or four years ago, it would probably come back very good. But it seems like he's changed his M.O. Uh, he doesn't have horses as cranked up first time out. He seems to be getting them to win a little bit later and, and just, just a different change in the barn. So that's a really good point about that one for 30 statistic. Let's move on to this late pick five sequence at Aqueduct. It begins with the sixth race, which is one of the graded stakes on this card. It's the grade three go for one handicap going a mile on the dirt. And, um, I'd be a little surprised if this go for one retains its grade three ranking after this running of the race, because this is not a strong field. Um, really, I think just two horses that even merit running in this race, and those are the two favorites, known to Madrigal and Sharp Star. The others, it seems like there's a little bit of wishful thinking going on, or perhaps a little bit of hustling by the racing office. Um... It is about the two favorites, uh, Nona Madeline. She's the one with the proven form and class, but you do have to kind of wonder what you're going to get from Sharp Star after that breakout performance over this track last time. 
Yeah, I, I didn't go too deep into this race because, like I said, I, I mean, there's only six horses to start with, but it sure does look like a two-horse field. Uh, Nona Madeline, she basically runs the same exact race every single time from a speed figure perspective. She runs between that 110 and 115 range, and it just comes down to if it's good enough to win. Uh, when she's placed in spots where it is, she generally gets the job done, and when it isn't, she doesn't. So, uh, no, she's just as consistent as they come. And I think the uh, the X factor is that horse Sharp Star. Uh, she ran huge last time, got a 121 figure for me. Uh, usually in a case like this, we'll look at the buyer, but I haven't had a chance to do it yet to see if he agrees. But uh, there hasn't been a whole lot run back from that field yet. Uh, there's several of them in a later race that we're going to talk about on the card. But uh for now, I guess I would have to make her my top pick. Uh, she is a three-year-old. She had every right to improve like she did last time. Maybe not quite to that level coming out of the uh, Black Eyed Susan. She really ran off the screen. But for now, I'm going to say I, I think that Fig's legit. And if I have to make a top pick in here, it would be her. Because I, I don't really, watching the race uh, and seeing it, I didn't see anything phony about it and don't see any reason a lately raced three-year-old couldn't run back to it. Yeah, I made no to Madeline my top pick. I'm not a big fan of this Phillies. Uh, I, I I just feel like she's the reliable option in this race. And if anything, turning back to the one-turn mile is probably going to be to her benefit because they've gotten her to go a mile and an eighth a few times. And she did win that race at Saratoga, the summer colony, going that distance. But I do think a mile and an eighth is really stretching her stamina to its limit. And uh, she just got a little tired over a very deep surface going that distance at Aqueduct and the turn back the alarm last time. So I think the mile is going to be better for her. I mean, I also think she figures to work out a pretty good trip here because she's got plenty of tactical speed. Portal creep to her outside. She's got speed, but she's just a little inferior. And frankly, I know the graceful princess went out and set a fast pace last time in the turn back the alarm with Pletcher training both of these horses. I'll be a little surprised if Graceful Princess uh, gets her stablemate beat once again, especially with Pledger electing to put Joel Rosario instead of Kendrick Carmouche on Graceful Princess this time. So um, I just think there's a lot pointing to Noah to Madeline maybe finding the right spot in here. Uh, as for Sharp Star, you know, Craig, we've talked about this a lot, how Aqueduct, this new dirt surface at Aqueduct, is one that just can produce these outlier performances from time to time. And... That could just be the case with Sharp Star, because I've got to say, I know this filly quite well. Me and Sharp Star, we're, we're, we're well acquainted. I, I was a big fan of this horse when she was in those New York bread allowance races early in the year. I, I, I picked her a few times. Um, you know, she even struggled against a mediocre group in the Black Eyed Susan. And then suddenly she looks like a graded stakes horse last time, maybe even a grade one stakes horse. Um I think the trip had a lot to do with that. That was a day at Aqueduct where I think you wanted to be forwardly placed and you especially wanted to be out of the kickback. And uh, Trevor McCarthy did a good job of getting her more forwardly placed than she usually is. And she was just outside without another horse in her path the entire way. Uh, this time, I doubt she's going to be quite as forward with some other speed in this field. And she is a horse who does have some gate issues from time to time and is also a horse who does react badly to being in behind horses. Uh, she kind of has that, that Mrs. Danvers quality to her where she does well when she's in the clear, not so well when she has to rate behind horses. So I'm just very skeptical. We're going to see that same performance out of her, just given the way this aqueduct track plays from time to time and from day to day over a different kind of surface over a sloppy track on Saturday. But that said, she is the exciting horse in this race and the real wild card. Uh, it's interesting you brought up the track at Aqueduct because that kind of gives me a, a segue into the other horse I wanted to talk about a bit. And it's a good point because if it was a typical Aqueduct track and we thought it was going to be dry, uh, I would be more likely to think Sharp Star would reproduce that race. But the other horse I wanted to mention that I, if she winds up drifting, maybe I'd give her a shot is Stand for the Flag. Uh, she was a horse who had ripped off a couple nice wins uh, earlier in her career. Uh, she went to Parks and Belmont and was running some big figures. And then she kind of got mar uh, mired on those tracks at Aqueduct where we have real low track speed ratings. And she wasn't able to reproduce her best form. Now, I know she's a former Jason Service horse. So that's all in first start in the barn for Rob Atras. So it's kind of a negative and a plus where... 
you know, who knows what service was doing with this filly. But Rob Atris does well with new acquisitions. And if she gets that sloppy track and not the typical aqueduct track she had to deal with last year, which is one I don't think she particularly cared for, uh, she could pop a big one. So if she drifted up from that morning line, I might give her a chance as a, a C and a pick five or pick four or something like that. Yeah, I mean, she is the third most interesting horse in this race by a long way. To me, it felt like she was one of those that was hustled into this race because you might notice she shares common ownership with Nona Madeline. So uh, even though it's a different trainer, I wonder if this is one that uh, they're running for that reason just to make this race go. We'll see. Uh, let's move on to race seven. Uh, this is the only turf race that's scheduled on Saturday. And I would imagine this one's probably going to get moved to the main track. As we mentioned earlier on, um, there's plenty of rain in the forecast. And if we even make it through the turf races on Friday, it seems like there's going to be a ton of rain overnight. So on the turf, um, I don't think it's very surprising that fetching is a short price in here. Um, she just has superior speed figures and she's been facing much better fields at this level. She handles the distance. She's just way the horse to beat on the turf. For me, the only other somewhat interesting horse was the number four, Madame McLean, because her one prior turf sprint was pretty good. And uh, based on the pace projector, she's supposed to have an advantage in here as the controlling speed. I don't want to spend too much time talking about this as a turf race, though, because it is likely to be off. And it's actually a decent field on the dirt because you do have five main track onlys in here and some horses in the main body of the field that do have some dirt form. Yeah, there are. Uh, it's a race, like you said. If it's on turf, I, I have no problem with the two that you mentioned. I think they would clearly be the two to beat. Uh, it's one thing to keep in mind if this race does come off the uh, turf and move the dirt, that pace projector, uh, and this is for customers, I know you know this, but it's going to look a lot different because we don't include the also eligible and the main track only is in the pace projector, so it will certainly shift. But frankly, I handicapped this race as one that's going to be over a sloppy dirt track. Uh, and I am going with the MTOs because while you do, as you say, some of the main track entrants do have some dirt form when it comes to the speed figures, they're all a few lengths below in my opinion. So those are the ones that I stuck with. I am going to really want to see what that pace projector looks like, uh, assuming that those switches do come. But that said, I mean, I looked at the race uh, that way and tried to envision what it would look like. And I still think it's going to be a race that's going to have plenty of speed. Uh, it should set up for a horse with maybe an off the pace run, though you always have to be careful with that over a sloppy track and watch what's going on early. But uh, likely favorite Prairie Fire, she uh, probably has a class edge in the field, but I don't think really has any big figure edge. So I look to some others in here and the one I'm leaning to is Dovey Lovey. I think uh, if the field sets up as it looks now, she should get a setup. She's got improving, uh, she's improving on her figures and they're competitive with the favorite. And also she's run well on a, a wet track several times before. So at the prices she would likely be, I guess she'd be my top pick. Uh, I don't really have any problem with any of the others. Uh, Sweet Kisses ran fine last time. Uh, Again, Jump for Joy is fine as well, but they all look like they could be doing up front. So that's why I kind of lean toward the two that will be more than likely be coming from a bit off the pace. Yeah, Prairie Fire, as you said, she's just the horse to beat on dirt. Uh, she's got those strong class lines coming out of those New York Bread Stakes races, and she's got a pretty adaptable running style. I mean, she is proficient coming from far back in the pack if the pace heats up, but as she showed last time, she can sit closer to the pace and still run a comparable speed figure. So I just think there's a lot to like about her, and her form seems consistent. The only thing not to like is she's going to be a pretty short price in here. Um... The other horses that could take money, um, the number 15 jump for Joy, she actually finished ahead of the horse that you like a little bit, Dovey Lovey, in that claiming race last time. To me, that race got a higher figure than I would have expected for the horses that were involved. Um, maybe they'll run back to it. Maybe they won't. We'll see. Um, Jump for Joy, though, to me, she just looks a little bit cheap, and she's going to have a tough time, I think, dealing with the horse all the way on the outside. The number 16 Forgotten Hero, who is just a bullet out of the gate. I mean, she's one who can be a runoff at times, and she makes it tough on any other speed horses that are in the same race as her. So that could work against Jump for Joy, and... I went in a slightly different direction and landed on the number 12, Sweet Kisses. 
I do think she's capable of stalking and sitting right off the pace. Um, she broke her maiden that way at Saratoga when she was a two-year-old and actually ran her best ever Time Form US Speed figure that day in the summer of her juvenile season, getting a 102. And she really wouldn't have to improve that much on that number to be competitive against this field now as a three-year-old. Now, she went off form for a little while. She ran on turf a couple times, but it seems like now Jeremiah Englehart has her going back in the right direction. And I thought she ran fine last time. To me, the seven furlongs just got the better of her because she had the race won quite decisively with an eighth of a mile to go, and she just basically hit a wall at the last furlong. So this time, if she can sit off the pace a little bit, I think cutting back is going to work for her, and I thought she was the best alternative to Prairie Fire. Uh, just a quick aside before we move on. You mentioned the figure for the uh, the race lovey doveys coming out of. Uh, people talk about sloppy track and off-track figures sometimes and, and think they're not reliable, which, I mean, I would agree, but I just wanted to address. I mean, I'm not saying they're not reliable, but they're definitely tougher to make is my point. Uh, I would say figures aren't really, like people just tend to dismiss figures because, oh, they're on a sloppy track. Today's a fast track. I think it goes a little deeper than that. And one thing we know is when the track is sloppy or good and when it's just not a fast track and the weather's changing and things, is that the track's changing and just it makes those things tougher to deal with. Oftentimes you're trying to group races together that you're not really sure if, if the track was the same, but maybe they look close. So I just wanted to bring up that point that it's not necessarily just that the track's wet and off that makes the figures a little more questionable than fast track. It's just that they're tougher to make because of those changing conditions. No, it's a good point. And it's even tough to make track bias uh, determinations on days with a lot of rain because the track can change from race to race when there's rain falling throughout the day. I mean, if you think something as simple as a tractor going over the track is going to change the way a racetrack is playing, well, Mother Nature is certainly going to have an impact as well. So I do think it's worth paying attention to those things and maybe not always um, thinking that a track stayed the same the entire day when, uh, when there is plenty of uh, rain falling. Let's move on to the middle leg of this pick five sequence. That's the eighth race. This one's a New York Brit allowance. Nominers of one going a mile on the dirt. And I think we're going to have a prohibitive favorite in here in the number two wasp. And it's one of these situations where you've got a horse that clearly has the most upside of anybody having made just two starts. But she's also a horse that at a pretty short price, it's not like she's got some speed figure edge over this field. So you're betting at a horse as the favorite that might need to improve a little bit. Yeah, and that, that's the kind of tactic I took in this race. I mean, I think she is probably the horse to beat in here, but I don't particularly love her or think she's any better than some others in here. And this kind of falls back to that sharp star race we talked about because there's several in here that come out of that race as well. And you, you kind of have to figure out what to do with that race and what you think of the horses that ran in, in behind her. And personally, I was impressed by... Uh, Blake Den Lady, the horse who was able to hold second. You don't often see a horse get passed as early as she did and be able to maintain and fight it out to the wire. So for me, it would be hard to pick any of the others from that race to turn the tables on her in here, unless you think she's just going to go out for the lead and maybe get cooked on the front end. But having that outside post, I, I think she should be able to stalk or get the lead. So for me, she's going to be my top pick and the horse to beat in here, just because I think she's going to offer better odds in the favorite she, she ran a faster race last time and I just like the resiliency she showed where the others in this field from that same race weren't able to catch her yeah to be clear I'm not way against wasp I just think in the long run you do well betting against these horses um in a pick five kind of wager I would definitely use her because she can certainly win this race just in the win pool she's likely to be an underlay because if you look back at that maiden victory last time Yes, she won a gear down and she was clear of by 10 lengths, but that was that was a maiden claiming field with a maiden special weight label slapped onto it. That was just a terrible group of horses in behind her. So um, I'd be a little bit skeptical of her if she is bet down to a very short price. And I, I agree with you, Craig. The interesting horses are those coming out of that sharp star race. I have a slightly different take on it. Um as I said, talking about Sharp Star, I think that was a, ra a race and a day where you saw some horses that stayed out of the kickback, able to run um, unusually fast races, even especially if they started out in races, started out ahead in races that f featured some congestion in behind them. And 
I thought Blitched and Lady was a little carried along by that situation. Don't get me wrong, she's definitely improved recently, and she's got the speed figures that say that she is probably the best alternative to Wasp. Uh, I just... I just wanted some others out of that race, and really just one other in particular. And it's the number one Lottie's Mizion. And I'll admit, this is a horse that's a little bit of a pet of mine. Uh, I have a, an opinion about her, and I'm still kind of waiting for it to totally be proven right. Um, but she is a horse who, going back to the beginning of her career, had a lot of excuses and got dropped down into some maiden claiming races, really because she had not achieved results after getting some poor trips and some of it was her own doing because at the start of her career she was a bad gate horse and was left with too much to do plenty of the time but i think she's putting it all together now and she won that race two back against twenty five thousand maiden claimers and got it done by seven lengths that was a commanding performance i mean to me she was every bit as impressive as wasp winning that maiden special weight race against a field that frankly wasn't that much worse than the one wasp beat and uh she did get a lower speed figure but she stepped up last time in that sharp star race, and if you watch it, I think she's a quintessential example of a horse that might have been hindered by kickback because she was in the back early towards the inside, just completely covered in dirt, and she got shuffled back a couple times as horses were tiring, her face coming around the far turn, and she ultimately got clear in the stretch but just had lost so much momentum at that point she couldn't make up that much ground. I, I don't think that's a true indication of where she's at right now. Now she's getting reunited with her maiden winning jock, Manny Franco, and she's landing in a, pa a race that's supposed to have a little bit of pace out of her. I know that she's got to improve to beat this field, but she's going to be a big price, and I just have to give her one more chance. Well, I'm never going to argue with a uh, three-year-old filly who you need to improve that has basically been improving numerically every single time. And that's certainly a race I'll go back and take a look at because honestly, when I saw that running line, I, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. So you make some good points, Aaron, as well. You you saw the T, which I didn't see. So butched in lady. I, I'm not sure what kind of butchered version of the name I came up with, but <laughs> I appreciate you saying it correctly. Well, I wish you luck with some of the horses in the upcoming race we're going to talk about because the two favorites have some names that are tough to get out. And that's the grade two Demoiselle going a mile and an eighth for the two-year-old fillies on the dirt. Um, the favorite is going to be the number one horse, uh, Mala Thought, who uh, goes out for Shadwell. This was a, a Stone Street bred horse who is by Curlin, out of that excellent damn dreaming of Julia. I mean, she's always been cut out to be this kind of horse, and she's really done nothing wrong so far in her career. Uh, that maiden race that she won, we talked about it on the pace cast at the time, that it looked like a race that could feature plenty of quality, and she took a big step forward next time when she just destroyed that field in the Tempted, uh, including beating uh, one of her rivals today, Cafe Society. Don't see any reason why more distance is going to be a problem for her, but this is a tougher spot than she faced last time. It is. She tries two turns. Like you said, it shouldn't, shouldn't really be a problem based on her breeding. Uh, she's run decent speed figures doing so and proved to 100 last time out. So she is clearly the horse to beat. Uh, and the other obvious contender is Meal Few. I, I'm going with John Embriali's pronunciation there as I did watch the replay. So if I'm wrong, I'll send him a note and blame Johnny I for that one. But I think he probably knows what he's talking about. But I thought she was every bit as impressive breaking her maiden. Uh, she got a 98 time form U.S. speed figure for the win. Uh, she did it visually impressively. She rated nicely. And I don't think two turns is going to be any problem for her either. So, uh to me, I think they, they both are probably, I mean, maybe I'd say it's a 45, 35% chance to win the race, but I think they're pre, uh, a lot closer than the odds would, would pretend. Uh, so if I had to make a top pick between those two, it would be Neil Few, just based on the, the value. If there was one other horse I was going to give a look to in here, uh, it would be the Oh, the name is uh, escaping traffic lane at a, a long price. Now, I know she uh, ran big last time and when she moved to turf, but she is a two-year-old who didn't run terribly on dirt. She handled slop fairly well uh, in her maiden try two back. So I think it's always a, at least a little bit of a question mark of was it the turf or is she just an improving horse who could handle dirt again. So at the, the morning line of 20 to one, she was, is one I would use defensively if I was looking for a score and pick fives, but that the race definitely boils down to the two favorites uh, as the most likely winners. But again, I don't think the gap between the two is all that great. 
I think it's Milfoy. I, I like to watch uh, the Great British Bake Off, and it's a pastry that they're tasked with making on that show every so often. It's like a, a layers of, of puff pastry and cream and custard. It looks very decadent, uh, but I think it, at least that, that's how they say it on the show. Um, I can't believe I don't know that because my wife and my daughter watch that all the time. <laughs> uh, I don't watch it usually, but I certainly am in the room when they're watching it, but I, I guess I need to pay closer attention attention but I, I have nothing really against her in here she's just run a little bit slower than mala thought so far and she's not coming out of the strongest maiden race uh that that's milfoy um she was very visually impressive in doing so um but uh she was beating a couple of first time starters and going that route distance that that I, I don't know how good they really are we'll see this is going to be a real class test for her but she's got one of these judd mod pedigrees um, she's a daughter of Curlin, as are the top three choices in this race. It's just a Curlin dominated race. So really, none of them are supposed to have problems with distance, including the number four Malibu Curl, who's also coming off a of maiden victory. And she could end up being the forgotten horse in here because she hasn't run quite as fast as some others so far. But she beat a decent field at Saratoga going seven furlongs last time and stretching out is supposed to be good for her. She's going out for Tom Albertrani, who really never has horses cranked up towards the start of their careers. So um, she's supposed to get better with more experience um i thought they were the right three horses i put them in odds order one three four um really the only question i have about malathot is the trip because she's drawn the inside and there is some speed door outside especially in the form of the number seven karamoka who's coming um out of that sprint victory against new york breads but um aside from that i just thought those were the right three horses and i would lean most heavily on malathot yeah, I did think about that for Mala Thought. I'm just, at this point, I, I'm not even sure she's a horse that has to have the lead. Uh, she She's actually rated really nicely if you look at her sp pace and speed figures on, on our PPs where she's finishing stronger than she went early. So that's always a little iffy for me. The one thing I do want to mention about the horse, you said Malibu Curl, because I, I did mean to say this earlier, is though her speed figures are a little lacking uh, compared to the others, she ran an 88 in her win. It's uh, important to note that race did take place a full two months before the others and when we're talking about two-year-olds that two months can make a world of difference let's close things out with the final race at aqueduct on saturday that is the feature the grade one cigar mile and as you said craig not the strongest cigar mile field that we've seen in recent years or really going back throughout the history of this race uh but we do have one horse that i think a lot of people are looking forward to seeing making his grade one debut, and that's the number one performer. Uh, this is a horse for Suge McGahee and the FIP stable that has always been cut out to be this kind of horse that can compete in these grade one races. It's just taken him a little bit longer than I think a lot of people expected to get here because he had some setbacks early in the year. I know COVID-19 threw off the schedule that Suge McGahee had for him because, according to Suge, he was ready to run in that Carter when it was originally scheduled going back to, to early April, and things went around rye he missed the rescheduled carter in june and had to take the summer off but he returned last time at belmont going the same distance and boy did he look awfully good i know he only won by a length and three quarters but joel rosario never asked him for anything he was just hand riding him through the lane based on the race he ran in the discovery last year if this horse takes a step forward second off the layoff he's going to be pretty tough against this field yeah, he's clearly the horse to beat. I mean, any way you look at it, uh, he's five for six in his career after dropping his debut. He's won five in a row. He's done it with some big speed figures. His return was a 124, but he had run a 130 in that discovery last year. So, I mean, it's not like he should be topped out. And I doubt he was fully cranked for that race coming off an almost year layoff. So he's definitely the one to beat. I I'm excited to watch this race for him because... Honestly, we don't have a whole lot in the older horse division. It's it's always kind of iffy to see which three-year-olds are going to step up next year and, and join the top of the division, which ones are going to stick around. But I don't think performers going anywhere, and, and he certainly got the figures to be a grade one horse. So he's the one to beat. I mean, I guess I would begrudgingly make him my top choice because just because I think he's that strong. And some of the other main contenders I, I just can't get too excited about. Uh, King Guillermo, he's a, a horse who I think is third or fourth choice, maybe third choice on the morning line. And we haven't seen him since the Oakland meet, which seems like about five years ago, with given all that's going on with 
2020, he's been pointed to so many races. He was supposedly training up to the Derby. And then, I mean, who knows what's going on with him, but there's no way I could take a horse like him in a race like this off this long layoff when he's missed so many starts. And there's our old friend, Mr. Buff, that tank of a horse who just always seems to run huge races when he's in against lesser competition. But for whatever reason, he just doesn't show up in these bigger spots. Uh, I keep hoping he does, and I want him to, but I, I just have a hard time betting him at this point because he's let me down so many times. Uh, the one horse, and Forense Fire is the other one I wanted to mention. He's done okay. He comes out of a third in the Breeders' Cup sprint, and I'm sure he's going to take some money off of that. But the truth is he just hasn't run particularly fast since he's uh, moved to the Barna Kelly Breen. He's a horse who, on his best days, uh, would run in the mid to upper 120s, uh, and he's yet to hit that 120 mark. So I, I don't know how you could think a horse like him is going to be able to step up and be performer if he shows up. The uh, one price horse I, I do want to take a chance with, and don't sweat it, it's not going to be Bone Ray's own. I'm saving him just for you, David. Uh, I, I want to hear what you think, whether you like him or not. But uh, the horse I am going to take a shot with uh, is Snapper Sinclair. He's 20 to 1 on the morning line. Uh, he's actually been running on turf last time, but I think he's run pretty well in those spots. Uh, he's still he's a heavily raced five-year-old. This guy just is a machine. He keeps cranking out race after race. And he's the one that if I was looking to be performer, having question marks about a lot of the others that are going to take money that I want to take a shot with because he's run well on dirt before. Uh, he's been uh, in against some better horses, but uh, you know, at, at this weak race, uh, weak rendition of the cigar mile, I want to take a shot with a big price. And he's the one I landed on. Yeah, we kind of have a similar take in that I wasn't that interested in the horses that are likely to take money behind Performer in this race. Like you, I, I'm making Performer my top pick. Um, I think I'm even a little more of a fan of him than you are. I I, I just think this horse uh, has a ton of ability. And uh, in my opinion, he deserves to be every bit of the short price he's going to be in here. Uh, maybe the wet track's a question, but it's a question for everybody. And uh, I'm just very much looking forward to seeing how he performs against this field. And I should mention, um, you know, it, it's looking less and less likely Forenze Fire is even going to run in this race. Because if you read Dave Grinning's uh, preview of this race on DRF.com, Kelly Breen did say that if the track comes up sloppy, they're probably going to scratch Forenze Fire. You can't blame them because his prior two races on sloppy tracks this year have been utter disasters. So they might just want to find a different spot for him over dry going if it uh, if that rain does come on Saturday. And also mind control. They said they might not run if the track comes up sloppy for the similar reasons. So this field could scratch down even further. It's something to watch out for. And um, the two other horses that you mentioned that could take money, I have trouble making a case for them as well. The number six, King Guillermo, who... Yes, he showed promise early in the year and looked like one of the uh, the more talented three-year-olds out there. But where has he been? He's missed so many dates that he races that he was supposed to run in. Even by the own admission of his trainer, he was doing better coming into that aborted start in the Kentucky Derby than he's doing right now. So I'm just very skeptical of him. And Mr. Buff, I mean, I'm a huge Mr. Buff fan, but I mean... I've given him all the chances I can in these graded stakes races, and he just hasn't gotten it done. Maybe this is a slightly easier grade one than he's tried in the past, but it just feels like he likes being that big fish in a small pond, and that's not the case here with a horse like Performer also in the starting gate. And like you, Craig, I wanted to look for prices to use underneath, though I went for different prices. Um, I was most interested in, surprise, surprise, uh, those two Calumet farm horses towards the outside. Um, Bone Ray's on who I'll get to, but particularly True Timber, um, who this is his third try in the Cigar Mile, and he's done well in this race in the past. He was second in this race in 2018, third in this race by maximum security last year, and he's arguably maintained his form this year for Jack Sisterston. Um, maybe he's been a little bit inconsistent, but he ran really well uh, in the teeth of that fast pace holding on for third in the forego, and he got back on track last time in the Lafayette. He handles a mile, and he's got good tactical speed drawn outside in a race where the pace situation looks a little bit confusing, so I think he's going to get a good trip. Um, I just think he makes a ton of sense, and he's going to be a big price in this race. And the number nine, Bone Raison, who I have crazy love for. Um, I don't think he's ridiculous in this race either because 
He's got speed figures that put him in the mix. Even just going two back to that six furlong race that he won, he's a versatile horse who is proficient going longer distances. He's gotten the mile in the past, and we'll see how much pace materializes, but he could be the longest shot on the on the board, and I think he's got past races that make him interesting, and he's certainly heading in the right direction for Jack Sisterson. So um, I would use the eight and the nine heavily in exactus and trifectas underneath the performer. Yeah, I think we have similar strategies. I'm definitely going to use some price horses. I mentioned Sle- uh, Snapper Sinclair as the one I prefer the most, but I definitely have no problem with the ones you mentioned. Uh, as you were talking, I was scrolling through True Timber's performances, uh, past performances. It's amazing to me. It's a horse who hasn't won a race in September of 2018, which is really hard to do when you consistently run the really high speed figures he does, but he just is always in against top company. And we're not uh, advocating betting him the win here anyway, I don't think, just to to hit the board, which is something he's done frequently. I mean, he's won over a million dollars, so no problem with either of those two for me. Yeah, True Timber is one of those rare horses who's a millionaire who's never won a stakes race. It's just kind of funny. Maybe he'll finally get it done on Saturday, though. I think, once again, he's much more likely to get a piece than he is to to, to, to get the top prize. Though we'll see what happens with Performer, um, because he does have questions to answer, but I, I think he's going to... Uh, answer them resoundingly as uh, the horse to beat in this cigar mile. Um, Just to kind of review before we wrap up, Craig, uh, this was not a pick five sequence that I thought I would have to go super deep in. Um, I think there are some horses you can definitely key on along the way, like Performer in this last race. You got those two big favorites to kick things off in that go for wand. And I thought I could go pretty thin through the Demoiselle, maybe do the most spreading in those New York bred races and the allowance race, the seventh and the eighth. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. Uh, It's definitely one thing I'm going to be watching the early races for sure, because I think you want to see uh, two things. You want to see how Sharp Star does uh, early in that race for that later race. Unfortunately, that's not going to help with the pick five, but if you're betting vertically, you're going to want to see how she performs uh, for that allowance race. And the other thing is just to see how the track's playing, because when we get the rain that's expected, you just never know. I mean, sometimes speed's better than normal, sometimes it's worse than normal, and sometimes it doesn't matter. So, partic- and, and that's true of any day, but particularly when there's some weather. So, it's I'll definitely be focusing on that, and it'll probably have some influence on the bet but uh a pick five bet but i agree with you it's not one i'm going to spread terribly deep in too many legs try to come up with a pretty small ticket and and hope i can cash it yep i i completely agree with all of that it's definitely uh, a surface that you want to watch how it's playing throughout the day on saturday given all the rain that's expected Well, that's all the handicapping we got for this week on the forecast. Um, Obviously, stay tuned when we come back next Tuesday with uh, the Time Form US Pacecast, and we'll be recapping this entire Cigar Mile card, also talking about some other races that are taking place around the country. I'm sure we'll mention that Starlet that's that's going to be run on Saturday out at Los Alamitos. We've got a couple of standouts in there. Um, So a lot to look forward to on the racing calendar this week, and we'll recap it all when we do that Time Form US Pacecast on Tuesday. Remember that you can always Please listen to us on DRF.com, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and SoundCloud. Wherever you get your podcast, just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Forum channel. Thanks for listening this week, and tune in again next week for that Time Form US Pacecast.